with a sunshiny smile Heard the roar of a plane as it sailed through the sky To a playmate she cried with a bright twinkling eye My daddy rides that ship in the sky Oh, my daddy rides that ship in the sky My daddy rides that ship in the sky Mama's not afraid and neither am I my daddy rides that ship in the sky Let's go back about 200 years. That's a picture of the Blue Ridge Mountains, which you guys are fortunate to live very close to. If you lived 200 years ago, you might live in a house like that, a log cabin, and the logs would come from the trees right around you. And you wouldn't go down to Walmart for your food. You'd grow some corn and some other stuff in your garden, and you'd have some chickens to get your eggs. And for your meat, you might eat a hog, part of a hog that your, your dad or mom butchered, but most likely, most of the time, you might be eating some food that you went out and hunted. And that's a hunting dog, and he's tree and some animals up there. Might be those raccoons, that's from a separate picture. I'm gonna show you a little dog that you might want me to make for you out of this balloon, okay? I'm gonna make a little snout, okay? Put some ears on him. Let's give him a neck and a couple of legs. One, two, give him a little body. His dog in his name was blue. Had a dog in his name was blue. Had a dog in his name was blue. Extra five dollars, he's a good dog too. Here's your dog. Here, Blue, you good dog, you, can you sing that with me? Here, Blue, you good dog, you, well I shouldered my gun and I tooted my horn, gonna catch a possum in the new round corn. Old Blue barked and went to see, he cornered a possum in a simmon tree. Here, Blue, you good dog, you, here, Blue. You know, old Daniel Boone had a dog and his name was Blue. He was a really, really good hunting dog. And one day Daniel was out hunting. They were running across a field. Out of the distance flew an arrow. It came so fast that when it hit old Blue, it split it right in two. The front half split away from the back half, just like that. Well, Daniel was always prepared. He had some super glue in his pocket. He grabbed that super glue, he slapped a little bit on the front end, he slapped a little bit on the back end, and he held them together. Count to five with me. One, two, three, four, five. Blue is all back together again. He blinked his eyes. He licked Daniel's cheek. He was all back together and barely lost a heartbeat. Now the only problem was Daniel was in such a hurry that when he put them back together, he put the back end on upside down with his legs facing up and down. And you know, super glue, once it's stuck, you can't do anything about it. So that's the way glue was for the rest of his days. And you might think that would be a problem, but it wasn't because See, Blue would run for a while on his front legs, and when he'd get winded, why, well, just flip right over on his back. <laughs> so it didn't turn out so bad after all. That's old Blue. I'm going to put him over here with these dog books because I'm making him to encourage you to check out some good books about dogs. Now, if you're reading chapter books and you want to read a good, good old hunting story, and parents, if you want to read one to your kids, Try Where the Red Fern Grows, about a boy who has two hunting dogs. If you want just a plain old feel-good story, try Because of Wind Dixie. 
The girl moves to a new town with her, with her pa, and they live in a trailer. She doesn't know anybody. She feels lonely. One day she's walking around in Winn-Dixie supermarket and she sees a stray dog running all over. And she convinces her dad to let her adopt that dog. She names him Winn-Dixie. And everywhere that dog runs off to, she follows and she meets somebody new. Turns out real well. And if you're at four, five, six year old, I highly recommend the Henry and Mudge series. Raise your hand if you've read any of the Henry and Mudge books. Good. They are fun, aren't they? That Mudge is the cutest dog, but boy, does he slobber. <laughs> Recycling, maybe how you use things in new ways. Okay, well, in the old days, when you got these big old holes in your blue jeans, like he's got, and your mama said, Uh uh, no more wearing those blue jeans, she didn't just throw those blue jeans out, she took the blue jeans and she cut out squares and shapes out of the good part of the blue jeans. She did that with all the leftovers for the clothes, and then when she got a nice big pile, she'd say, it's time to make a patchwork quilt. And she'd sew those patches together, and she'd make something new out of those old things. Now, here are the motions. I want you to put on a pair of glasses for your grandma, because you know our eyes get old. On my grandma's, and probably the first place you need a patch, it's right here because you're sitting on it all the time. So for patch, I want you to kind of hit your bottom. Patchwork, and for quilt, I want you to pretend you've got a needle and you're sewing. Okay. All the grandma's patchwork quilt. Let me see it. Squares of corduroy and silk, then green and blue, and yellow too. On the grandma's patchwork quilt. What is a folk tale? Okay? Mm -hmm. It's a story that's been passed down from generation to generation. There you go. Okay. The idea with a folk tale is how it's come along. There's all kinds of different folk tales, but the basic idea is it's been passed along from generation to generation. And the reason that there are all these folk tales around is that if you go back 100 or 150 years ago, all the things that we use, all the devices like TVs and movie theaters and smartphones and computers, record players and radios, none of that was here. If you wanted to hear a story, somebody had to tell you that story right there where you were sitting. And so that's what people would do in the evening, was they would tend to sit around and sing old songs and tell old stories. And they had learned them from when they were kids. And they grew up and they told them to their kids. The banjo came to this country from Africa. When black people came to this country, they brought a little banjo with them. There are still, in Africa, there's about 60 different instruments that resemble the banjo. But now the banjo is used a lot by all kinds of people who like to play mountain music and bluegrass. I wish I was a bowl in the grass. And then again, oh, I wish I was a bowl in the ground. You sing great piles of mowing. up a verse to this song. All you need is an animal and a place that that animal is. Maybe what it does. Who's got an idea for an animal? Okay? Ooh. How about 
If I was a lion in the den, hmm, what would I do? What would I do if I was a lion in the I'll den? Hunt for food. I'll bring a zebra in. Oh. I what? I bring a zebra in. Bring a zebra <laughs> in. Well, the lion's got to eat, and that rhymes. He's got a good sense of rhyme. Let's do that one. I say go with that one. I wish I was a lion in the den. Now, there's different kinds of folk tales, and I'm going to give you some samples of them. We sometimes call them genres or subgenres. And one is the tall tale. Now, a tall tale is partly true. It starts with a real situation that would actually happen. And very often, usually, in fact, the teller kind of acts as if he didn't know that he was stretching the truth. He kind of acts like he's telling you the truth. But he's really exaggerating. And he's telling it just for the fun of it. He doesn't believe it. He's just telling it for the fun of it. Now who can tell me something that a possum does that helps it survive from its predators? It plays dead, that's right. And the reason it does that is that when a predator comes to eat it, if it thinks it's already dead, it thinks, oh, that's not fresh meat, that's not very good, it's been laying around for a while. I was out in the swamp, and I was trapped all the day. I come back into the camp and I say to my wife, what you have fixed to eat? I am very hungry. She say, not much, view, not much. I pick up a few shrimp and a crab, and with them I make a gumbo. A gumbo is a soup. Ah, chérie, I say, a gumbo is very little for a man fatigued like me, a man tired like me. Why you not kill a chicken? She say, we only have one chicken left, and she lay an egg every day. It would be a mortal sin to kill a beast like that. Just then, I hear a out in the backyard. I throw open the door, I look out, there is a rat de bois, and got our last hen by the neck. I run out in the yard, I pick up a stick, I give him a wrong good raton. I put his feet in the air. I say to my wife, look, look, the bon Dieu is bon, the good Lord is good. Now we're gonna have meat to eat. So, I take it, he hide over the zebi. He the fur trader in the next camp. He gonna take that hide and he gonna sell it. He take that hide and he give me a bottle of wine for trade. My wife, she fix up a little bread, she fix up a stew, and everything come good. A little while later, I open the oven door to see how everything is going. Now maybe you not believe this, but I open that oven and there is the rat de bois, he's standing up in the pan. He had eat the potatoes, he had drink the grease, he come running out the door, he run between my wife's legs, knock over the bread, knock over the wine, he go running out through the door. He grab that hand and he go running off. And that's not all. That night, he go back into Zebby's cave, he take the hide off of the stretching board, and he put it back on. Now that's something, huh? <laughs> And while he was there, he ate up the stew, and he went back to Zebby, who had his hide, and he took that hide off of the stretching board, he put it back on, and he ran off. Now, could a possum really do that? No. no, it's an exaggeration, but it's based on something true, which is that a possum plays dead. You can kind of see how people went to making up songs sometimes from this song. This song is called Waterbound and It Can't Get Home. You see, if you live way back in the mountains where there are deep valleys and it rains, that rain collects pretty soon in those valleys. It fills them up. That happened to me once when I was out in the mountains. I was singing with some kids back in a little community center way back in the mountains, and it rained and poured. And when I went to drive out of there, I got to that valley, and the water was about this deep. I couldn't get through it. 
I was water bound. Can you sing that with me? Yeah. Water bound and it can't get hard. 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 Sometimes people wanted to sing or play some music and they didn't have any regular instruments and they could play a little rhythm. It's always good to have rhythm like the drums behind, you're used to hearing drums behind music. Well, in the, in the old days, people sometimes would use some spoons to play the rhythm. You can try this when you go home and on the internet, on YouTube, you'll have little lessons of how to play the spoons. I won't teach you in too much detail, I know but what you do is you've got to get those spoons back to back like that. And you got to have a little space in between them. And what happens is if you grab them with your fingers like this and wrap them around, but put one or two fingers in between to leave a space, when you tap a spoon, it clinks against the other. So you tap it on your leg to give it a steady beat and then you hit your hand. and you do a little off rhythm, okay? So I'll play you a little bit. That's something else you can do. You've got to get your fingers really tight and wide, and then you can run them down the stairs like that. through the mountain, what they would do is they would have a drill and John Henry would hit that drill and then the shaker would twist it so it dug into the, into the rock. He'd hit it again, they'd twist it again. Hit it, twist it, hit it, twist it till they had a big enough place where they could put a stick of dynamite and then they would blow up a little more of the rock and start day, all over again. The owner of the, of the company brought a steam drill around. These were real machines that they invented to do the work and they said it could do the work of 10 men. Well, if it could do the work of 10 men, then nine of those men would be out of a job. So the legend says that John Henry raced that steam drill to see who could go further through the mountain in the same amount of time. Well, the captain said to John Henry, you know, bring me a steam drill around. I'm gonna bring that steam drill out. Captain, he said a man ain't nothing but 